Welcome back to the show that tells you, you are a quantum computer with free will, interacting with other conscious agents to generate space-time itself. My name is Justin Riddle, and this is episode 37 of the Quantum Consciousness series. In today's episode, I present an interview I conducted with Donald Hoffman on November 9th, 2022 in Irvine, California. In this episode, we discuss Don's theory of conscious agents and how his theory might be compatible with the mathematics of fundamental physics. By the end of today's episode, we'll ask the question, is there an objective world out there? And what is it like to be a conscious agent swimming in a sea of conscious agents? This episode is available on YouTube and an audio only version is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you like what you hear today, then please like this video, subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, or for the audio listener, write a review. Join me deep inside the mystery of numbers. Come and huff a metaphysical loop. See how concepts become objects and then become quadia. Join us for an episode of Quantum Consciousness. All right, welcome back. So before we dive into the interview itself, um, the conversation moves very rapidly and I felt like it was best for me to really slow it down a little bit and give a little bit of an introduction to Donald Hoffman's model of conscious agents related to the theory crafting we've been doing in this series thus far. Um, contextualizing his theory with respect to quantum consciousness models. And then we'll hop into his interview, and then we'll do a little bit of commentary after the interview. All right, so to start this off, let's discuss Donald Hoffman's theory of conscious agents. This is first presented in the Objects of Consciousness paper published in Frontiers of Psychology, and this was in 2014. And then we'll talk about his more recent paper, Fusions of Consciousness, which was published in 2023 in the journal Entropy. And really, these two papers are very similar. Um, it seems like the 2023 version is really an update to the model, and it covers a lot of the same material. Um, you can read either uh, paper first, although I kind of appreciate the first paper in that it relates more directly to quantum mechanics versus the second paper is diving into this concept of decorated permutations, which is sort of a translation of Markov chains, which we'll dive into in a second here. Okay, to start off with his conscious agents theory, um, he really motivates this by what he calls the interface theory of perception, okay? Interface theory is basically saying that your perception is more akin to a interface that has evolved through time, through natural selection, through Darwinian evolution, and the interface of your perception is not veridical. It's not capturing truth as it as it really is, but really it's capturing sort of icons that are most useful to the organism. So let me break this down. So the idea is that if I see some object, and he gives the example that you are a cheetah and you're hunting and you see a hunk of raw meat, right? And that hunk of raw meat is now a signal of, I need to go consume that raw meat to sustain myself. I feel an urge of hunger, a desire to interact with that hunk of raw meat. However, if I am a animal like a gazelle who's normally hunted by cheetahs, most likely this hunk of meat is another gazelle. So when I see the raw meat as a gazelle, I'm gonna get a very different image of that meat. The image that I will receive is a warning sign. Warning, there are predators here, you are in danger, you need to run away, right? So the idea is there's a mapping of the data itself 
into an abstraction that fits the organism. And so the rationale here is that evolution is not incentivized to evolve to give you the real data as it is, but really organisms need to optimize for their survival and for their own value structures. And so the information that you're acquiring as an organism is going to be shaped by your environment and by your particular needs and wants and demands. And, you know, we have sort of these icons of I am hungry, I must seek food, I must go find a mate, I need to go exert energy, right? There's these very abstract missions and goals that we're engaging with. Um, and he often equates this to a sort of video game where we're playing the video game of being a human right now and the sort of functions and actions that we're initiating are within the scope of this video game and those actions themselves aren't necessarily mapping onto something real in the environment because they are constructs generated by the organism through evolution okay and so from this he makes the argument that the fundamental building blocks of a conscious being are not space-time they're not particles we we're not going to build consciousness out of these units um, but instead he takes that conscious agents are fundamental Let's just assume there's these beings and then they are interacting with the world through um, these interactions. He, he talks a lot about measurement in quantum mechanics. So you have sort of these wave functions, these probability spaces that are measuring the environment. They're collapsing, becoming digitalized, becoming physical. And through that measurement process, we're acquiring information from our environments, but that information that we're acquiring is within the context of the person doing the measurement, right? So it's sort of this um, observation measurement question within quantum mechanics of the data that you're acquiring is always from the vantage point of the measuring device of the observer performing that measurement right and so to just pause right here for a second i think that this really is the fundamental framing of quantum consciousness models um, and he talks about this in his initial 2014 paper is that within Quantum mechanics, this measurement process, is the main way that we generate and create the very notion of physicality. Through the measurement process, through observation, things become digitized and things become physical. But underlying that is always some sort of quantum system. There's some quantum mechanical probability space. It's evolving along. It gets measured, it gets interacted with, it makes an observation of its environment, and then it becomes digitized or physical in that moment when it's acquiring that information. But inherently, intrinsically, the world is composed of these probability spheres moving around um, in, in their own sort of way. And so from this vantage point, he makes the argument that space-time is an emergent property of all these interacting conscious agents. We will call them quantum systems or quantum computers for the sake of, uh, of our own framing. And as these different conscious agents, quantum computers are interacting with each other, they're generating physical information and they're generating these moments of digitization through their interactions. Okay, so, so far, so good. Everything that Donald Hoffman is really spelling out with this initial framing of conscious agents is highly compatible with this quantum consciousness perspective where all things are these quantum systems. If we were to refer to them as conscious agents, then we would say the whole universe is a sea of conscious agents of these quantum systems 
and the physical world of space-time is sort of emergent from the interactions between all these conscious agents, and it really is sort of a shocking reality to wake up to where your conscious experience is fundamental, is the primary substrate of reality, and the physical world that we see out there is more so the emergent thing that needs to be created through all these interactions, not necessarily you, right? Whereas the standard model of how consciousness comes about is that there's neurons in the brain and they interact in some complicated way and that algorithm of these neurons interacting generates conscious experience. Here we're sort of flipping it on its head. We're saying consciousness, these conscious agents, these quantum computers are fundamental to nature and they interact with each other and that creates the emergence of the physical world. Okay, so we've also been talking about the penrose hameroff orchestrated objective reduction model. Within this model, they define a very clear boundary for what can be considered a conscious agent. And by conscious agent, of course, using their terminology, they would call it a quantum computer, right? And so the way that they frame it is that you cannot have chaotic, naturally occurring quantum computers because there's this massive chaotic force in the universe. And so biology has engineered these very carefully constructed ways in which you allow for quantum coherence to reign supreme. And then in those protected pockets, quantum computation occurs at a more advanced way, this objective reduction way that then becomes orchestrated across many, many uh, systems and becomes extended spatially. Um, this is how you build up larger and larger uh, conscious entities or larger quantum computers in a chaotic universe, right? And so there's really this secret sauce in biology which prevents environmental chaos from sort of taking over and you create these protected spaces for quantum computation to occur. So in Donald Hoffman's conscious agents model, there is not quite this same level of description of protecting a conscious agent from chaotic forces. Um, instead, it's a little bit of a flip of the script, right? So instead of saying that we're coming from this chaotic universe and we need to build quantum computers, he takes the approach that we except that conscious agents are the substrate of reality. And then we can go about describing um, human beings and biology and other systems in physics from this sort of assumption of a background of fundamental conscious agents. And I want to take one more second to make an aside to how the quantum consciousness model fits into this conscious agents model. So this other idea of interface theory, right? How would this manifest in a quantum computer? Well, the idea here is that within a quantum computer, you have a single probability space of all the possible different futures that could occur for that quantum system. We can imagine these as some sort of computation occurring, and these are the different computed possible futures that are evolving within this wave function. And how we can conceptualize this in the brain, um, I think a great uh, person that talks about this is Henry Stapp. In Henry Stapp's book, Mind, Matter, and Quantum Mechanics, he talks about how the Hilbert space, which is a way of mathematically describing this wave function, he says that there is a certain basis of eigenvectors, which you can think of these as sort of the minimal um, dimensions to describe that probability space, okay? And so from these eigenvectors, these represent the primary choices that the quantum computer can make, Okay, so I have option A, option B, option C, option D, option E, and these make the basis of my Hilbert space. 
And the computation can be envisioned as this wave function, which is a certain point in the Hilbert space that's moving around. And the quantum computation is the movement of that point through this multidimensional space, okay? And then when you get measured, when you reduce that wave function to a single state, the Hilbert space is going to collapse into one of these eigenvectors, and that is the choice that the person made. They decided to act, they collapsed onto that eigenvector, and that is the measurement process down to that one basis, okay? The problem here is that that measurement needs to get translated into the world outside. So how this works is there needs to be some measuring device that comes in and interacts with that Hilbert space. And so the measuring device can be conceptualized as asking a question, are you gonna do choice A or are you gonna do choice B? And let's say you choose choice A, well, the measuring device might not fit perfectly onto that wave function. So the eigenvector is sort of a mathematical perfection of that Hilbert space. And in reality, any sort of collapse process is gonna introduce some imperfection because the quantum computer needs to interact with some external object. And so the measurement interface here is going to be imperfect, okay? And so this kind of maps into interface theory in multiple ways. So one way where this, where this maps on is that yes, there's an inherent imperfection, an inherent failure to map the internal wave function probability space onto the external world. There's always gonna be some misalignment between your wave function and the measuring device, right? the external world is never gonna understand you perfectly enough to measure you in the correct way that fits with your internal perspective. This inherent misalignment is gonna mean that the translation of information internally is gonna be imperfect, and then the translation of action externally is also going to be imperfect, right? So that introduces a bit of chaos. Now, when it comes to the interface component, Henry Stapp makes this argument that if you are a quantum computer spread out among the neurons in your brain, you are sort of evolving through these arbitrary eigenvectors which map into different actions, and these have been trained over time, and they are arbitrary. So this is fully compatible with Hoffman's interface theory in that the quantum computer internally in the brain, according to this model, is sort of taking option A, option B, option C, option D, and it's choosing between these options, but those options are just different arbitrary patterns of activity onto neurons, right? Or microtubules or insert whatever biological system is the substrate of the quantum computer. So there's some random patterning of that physical domain and that random patterning has built up an association with the brain into enacting some set of actions, right? So from this perspective, there is an arbitrary mapping between the quantum computer and this pattern of activity. And so the interface theory is still fully accurate in that that information is arbitrarily constructed. It is getting regularities from the external world and it's building up patterns of regularities, but all of that interface could be sculpted by evolution through the structures of the brain regions and the processing pathways that might be instilled genetically into the organism itself. Um, and then it's also shaped through experience where you have your own particular way of collapsing your own wave function and that generates a system of abstract controls, or um, as Kastrup would say, this dashboard of dials. The Hilbert space is a series of dials that you have learned how to 
twist and tweak and turn. And each of those are arbitrary patterns of physical manifestations of this quantum computer, but it is inherently this sort of interface, an arbitrary interface sculpted through experience and evolution. All right, so next I want to go back into the Hoffman model. And trust me, all of this sort of uh, back and forth with quantum computers um, really helps this to be a unique perspective on the Hoffman model. And so where I think this really comes to a head, the primary formulation of the conscious agents model is threefold, okay? You have the world, the universe at large. You have experience, the conscious being experiencing that qualia, that experience of what it's like to have this moment in time. And then you have actions, okay? World, experience, and action. And there's this sort of flow between these three different worlds. And if you've been watching this series, you're screaming at your monitor right now, this looks exactly like Roger Penrose's three world model. And let me spell that out for you and make the connection. So in Roger Penrose's three world model, you have the world of experience, of mind. This is the domain of quantum computers, of quantum systems, these probability distributions. You have the physical world where actions occur. This is the physical domain. This is the realm of digital computation, of measurements. Everything becomes digitized and physical upon the collapse of these probability um, wave functions into the physical domain. And then he introduces a third world of platonic forms. So Roger Penrose suggests that there is this world of mathematics, this domain of understanding, which is transpersonal, that goes beyond any individual, okay? So I'm making a little bit of a leap here when relating it to Don Hoffman, but Don Hoffman has the world of experience. This is a probability distribution, a Markov model, which is a system that moves probabilistically through a series of states, okay? very much akin to this quantum computer probability distribution that um, is posited by Roger Penrose. This is the domain of experience. There is the domain of action. Here, Roger Penrose calls this the physical domain where measurements are occurring. But Don Hoffman does not distinguish between actions and experiences. These are kind of two different types of Markov models, two different states that are moving around. Um, however, in the Penrose model, they would have a very different flavor to them, right? These are different components of reality or aspects of reality versus in the conscious agents model, it's as if every conscious agent has a capacity for experience and a capacity for action and your experience causes some actions and then you receive perceptions from the world at large. Okay, and then the world at large in Hoffman's model represents the full domain of all conscious agents interacting, and he operationalizes this as these networks. So we imagine two conscious agents and three conscious agents, and these are these networks of agents interacting with each other, um, versus in the Roger Penrose model, he posits that this is the domain of mathematics, some sort of fundamental uh, math that, that guides the universe, um, versus in Hoffman, this is, this is all conscious agents in the world. And you can kind of define the boundary of what system you're analyzing, and the whole system, to whatever extent you analyze it, would be that third domain of the world. Okay, so in the Hoffman model, the world gives you perceptions into your experience. The experiencer makes a decision to act and then generates an action. That action then acts, he kind of uses the word act twice, that action makes an impact on the world. Okay, and this completes the three worlds within the Hoffman conscious agents model. 
there is this flow of information and the world, your experience and these actions are sort of incrementally moving through time. And he describes all of these as Markov models. So a Markov model or a Markov chain is a series of moments in time. This is the chain component. And the Markov reference essentially means that there's some probability distribution of what state you're going to occupy at any given moment. And then you move from one state into the next state through time. So a Markov chain is typically described as a matrix where you're starting off in one state and you're moving into another state and you're sort of traversing this network or this graph of possible states. And so the matrix sort of represents the probability of going from one state into the next state. And what's cool about these Markov chains is that they can undergo these learning processes. And so a lot of modern machine learning is taking these probabilistic agents and then exposing them to an environment, giving them some reward function. And as they get exposed to different events, they're forced to probabilistically choose different actions. They get feedback from those actions, and then they update that probability distribution of what they want to do um, in, in the next step in the future. So there's sort of this Bayesian learning process of expose me to an event, update my model, and then I keep moving through the world. So there's sort of this temporal extension, this chain as you evolve through time, exposed to new events, receiving information, updating your belief structure or your action plan. So there's something very real about these Markov chains, about these Bayesian learning processes. And I've talked about this in a previous episode, um, but it really is a compelling model for, uh, yeah, modeling reality itself, okay? So Hoffman's really banking on this probabilistic learning model. So diving into these conscious agents, you can view it as having two different states. There's some sort of action and some sort of experience, and the experience is choosing an action. The action is inputting into the world at large. There's some information from the world at large coming into your experience, creating a decision into the action node, going back into the world, and there's sort of this flow of information as you perceive and act, perceive and act, and you're interacting with the world, right? Pretty great model, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And each of these states are being modeled as Markov chains where your experience and your action set can move around among different states and sort of build patterns of activity of how they want to perceive and how they want to act in the future. And then what you can do is then you can chain up a bunch of these conscious agents. So if you have two conscious agents, this is sort of the, the minimal set, you have two experiencers and two actors, right? So there's sort of four nodes in this double conscious agent system. And if we design our world, to just have these two um, conscious agents linked up, then what we can create is what he calls uh, these conjoined conscious agents, where the actions of one feed into the perceptions of the other, and the actions of the other feed into the perceptions of the other one. So there's sort of this closed loop of perception and action among the two conscious agents. And in this scenario, Donald Hoffman says that the two agents have fused and they become one macro conscious agent describing the whole system. Okay, now what you can do is we can add a third conscious agent and we can spice up the interactions here where let's say one of these agents is only receiving actions and it's not able to act on the other conscious agents, right? 
So we can devise a system where some conscious agents are only able to receive information from a subset and only able to deliver actions from a different subset or the same subset. So we can mix up these sort of action perception pairings among these conscious agents and we can build a more nuanced, interesting network of conscious agents with directed edges. So instead of having these conjoined edges perfectly fusing together, you can have directed influence from one to another. And just to read uh, a brief passage on how Donald Hoffman describes this, given any pseudograph of conscious agents with any mix of directed and undirected edges, then any subset of conscious agents from the pseudograph adjacent to each other or not, can be combined to create a new conscious agent. So essentially what he's saying is that any permutation of pairings of these different conscious agents can also be viewed as a conscious agent in and of themselves. And so what comes out of this conscious agent model is that all of the universe is proposed to be conscious agents, okay? And all conscious agents have some directed or undirected edges with each other. Undirected means that they're conjoined and all of their perceptions and actions flow into each other. And directed means that these conscious agents um, only receive a perception or only are able to give an action with some other conscious agent. And the universe is this vast graph of all of these conscious agents interacting with each other and evolving through time incrementally. And what he then says is that there's now a complex hierarchy, a nested hierarchy, where conscious agents at multiple levels now have their own causal structure, okay? And this is where it gets a little more mind-blowing even than before. So let me read another passage to really exemplify this. These are This is his concluding paragraph of his first paper. The idea is that one system of conscious agents might infrequently interact with another system, an interaction that can be modeled using stopping times. Such interactions can create new conscious agents. Using the combination theorems presented earlier, whose time is moving more slowly than that of the original systems of agents involved in the combination, the hierarchy of stopping times proceeds all the way up to the slow times of our own conscious experiences as human observers, um, and then all the way down to Planck time. The hierarchy of stopping times is linked to a hierarchy of combinations of conscious agents leading up to the highest levels of conscious agents that constitute us and beyond. So essentially what he's saying is that these stopping times are these moments where these larger scale conscious agents will meaningfully interact with the lower scales. The lower order scales are operating more quickly than the higher order scales. So the higher order scales are big and slow and they interact periodically at this slower rate. Meanwhile, these faster agents are going much more quickly. And this builds this nested fractal hierarchy of conscious agents inside of conscious agents inside of conscious agents. And the whole universe essentially sums up to be one giant universal conscious agent and it, you can zoom down that fractal hierarchy to hit your conscious mind, zoom in more into your brain regions and neurons and microtubules and proteins, down, down, down into this Planck scale and you can see conscious agents down there. Okay, so essentially he has this mathematical model where the world is essentially this giant fractal of conscious agents nested within each other, okay? And this is his entire model. And now I wanna throw this back to the three world model that I've been talking about in this series. So if you go back to my hierarchical consciousness episode 
or to the fractal computer episode, I make this argument that the platonic world, the world of mathematics of forms, is essentially a nested hierarchical infrastructure where you have conscious beings nested within each other and made of other conscious beings, right? So you have the physical world of actions, of things interacting with each other, of these conscious agents interacting. You have the mental world of these conscious beings. And then you have this hierarchical fractal nesting infrastructure, which then describes the universal mapping of all of these beings, okay? And then what Donald Hoffman then goes into, and this is what I really love about this model, is that from all these permutations of all these conscious beings nested within each other, he claims that this is fundamentally compatible with physics fundamentally. And I think that this is definitely a bit speculative at this point. And, you know, he claims this mapping is present and he articulates it in the interview that I'm about to show you um, to some degree, although I think this is a very challenging concept to, to grok. Um, but essentially from that fractal infrastructure of all these conscious agents interacting with each other at all these levels, all these scales, all these orders of magnitude, these are these permutations that derive all things and potentially core mathematics, these core geometric structures at the basis of our reality um, can be derived from that, from that infrastructure. So that is sort of the pipe dream in all of this. And I want to just quickly add the caveat that I'm adding my own flavor here, right? In my perspective of this three world model, there's the physical domain of space time, of the physical world that's generated through measurement and through interactions. This is the domain of digital computation. There's the domain of quantum computation, which is our minds, our experience, the qualitative experience of being you. And then you're plugged into this fractal hierarchy of all these other conscious beings and from that perspective, this is the universal lens, the, the biggest scale of all things together. And from that scale, there's this universal context. There is this deeper meaning, this bigger connection, and potentially mathematics and forms are present in that fractal organization itself. And potentially there's some other form of computation that might be ongoing at that, at that fractal macro scale. Um, but I want to caution that Donald Hoffman is not necessarily making these distinctions that I'm making. He's saying that there's conscious agents, they form this fractal hierarchy, and they relate to fundamental mathematics. And he's not making a strong claim on quantum computers and digital computers. He's saying that space time and quantum computers and quantum mechanics itself are derivative from this conscious agent perspective. Um, but he's not having this sort of strong three world labeling system that I am applying to, to this model. All right. So that was a long, long, long setup, but, um, I'm going to hop into the interview now. Um, I just want to preface this by saying this was recorded during the pandemic. Um, so out of respect for Dawn, I was wearing a mask during this. So a lot of my audio might not be that great. Um, and we were also had a very limited amount of time for the interview for other constraints. Um, so it's really just a quick 20 minute interview. So we'll hop into that and then I'll do some commentary afterwards on what I think this means. All right, so I'm sitting here with Donald Hoffman. Uh, do you want to just introduce yourself briefly, and then uh, we'll dive right in? Okay, I'm I'm Don Hoffman. I'm professor emeritus of cognitive sciences at the University of California, and uh, study consciousness and uh, visual perception and so forth. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah, it's really excited to be here. Uh, big fan of your work. Thank you. 
Um, so maybe you could just start off giving us a little introduction to your notion of conscious agents and this theory that you're, you've been working on for a while. Yeah. So everybody's interested in consciousness right now and how consciousness might arise from the brain activity or some other kinds of, of activity. But our approach is different. We're, we're saying um, consciousness is fundamental. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not derived from something inside space-time, but it's prior to space-time. So that's a fundamental difference in the way we're thinking. So consciousness is fundamental and space-time is going to be uh, an emergent property of consciousness, not, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the reason we're doing that is because it's, physicists have discovered that space-time is not fundamental. And our own work on evolution of natural selection agrees that uh, our perceptions don't show us reality. In other words, space and time and objects in space and time, which is the form of our perception, is, is not the fundamental nature of reality. At least that's the implication of evolution mm -hmm, by natural mm -hmm. selection. So once again, space-time isn't fundamental from an evolutionary point of view. So when our two pillars of modern science, you know, evolution by natural selection and, and quantum field theory with gravity, tell us that space-time is not fundamental, um, it's time for cognitive neuroscientists to take note and, and to start to work accordingly. So mm -hmm, instead of mm -hmm. trying to get consciousness booted up from brain activity, we need to look beyond space-time. And fortunately, the physicists have already gone there. So the physicists have found something called the amplitudehedron, which is a geometric structure, not inside space-time, not at the Planck scale. It's utterly outside space-time. Mm -hmm, it's prior mm -hmm. to space-time. And it's got many, many dimensions so you could have trillions of dimensions in an amplitude and you could have quadrillions and they eventually project down into the trivial four dimensions of space-time or maybe mm -hmm, 10 or 11 mm -hmm. of string theory. But, but so the, you can see this is a completely different game. It's, it's, it's not trying to boot up something from like an automata theory of space-time or what's happening at the pixel level of space-time. It's, it's yeah, completely yeah, yeah. different. Space-time is just a little simple, trivial, comparatively data structure. And these deeper mm -hmm, data structures mm -hmm. that have many, many more dimensions that are utterly beyond space-time, uh, and, and they're beyond quantum theory. So, so the amplitudehedron, there is no notion of Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the idea is that that you get space-time and quantum theory emerging, as they say, joined at the hip, gotcha, together from gotcha. the deeper structure that um, is not about space and time, and it's not about quantum theory, it's not about Hilbert spaces, and so. And behind that, they find, so there's the amplitudehedron and some other structures. But behind the deepest structure are these things called decorated permutations. And they're like mm. normal permutations where you shuffle things and so forth, but they're, they're slightly fancier. They're, and we can go into it if you want, but they're, they're, they're just slightly fancier, but they're the same idea that you shuffle things. So mm. and it's a surprise. What, you know, the, deeper, the deepest structure we found beyond space-time is like shuffling cars. What, what's that all about? And there's no notion of dynamics. You know, what is this all about? So that's what we're doing with our theory of conscious agents. So we have, a, we have this mathematically precise theory. And if people want to see the mathematics, there's a paper called Objects of Consciousness. Mm -hmm. So if you just Google okay. Objects of Consciousness and Donald Hoffman, <clears throat> it's free online. And, and the math yeah, is completely yeah. spelled out, no, no hand waves. So you can see the mathematics. It's a Markovian dynamics. And so, but it's the dynamics of consciousness, not inside space time, but in entirely prior to space-time. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, how could that dynamics give rise to space-time, right? So if, you, I mean, if you're going to say consciousness gives rise to space-time, then somehow you're going to have to show how space-time gets booted up from the dynamics of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to do that? Well, we decided that the physicists have already done half the work for us. The physicists have said space-time itself is booted up from the amplitudehedron, and the core of the amplitudehedron is booted up from these decorated permutations. Gotcha. And so in the last few months, we said, OK, so let's, the physicists have told us what to do. You need to plug into decorated permutations. So let's plug into the decorated permutations. So we discovered a new map, and apparently it's never been done before, from that assigns to any Markovian kernel, any Markov chain, mm -hmm. canonical assignment of a decorated permutation. So we're able to take our theory of conscious agents which would solve some other problems we can talk about, like the combination problem of, of mm -hmm. subjects and also qualia. So it solves that problem, but but it also provides this very rich dynamics. You, you, you have networks of conscious agents that are computationally universal. So anything you can do with Turing machines or you know artificial neural networks, you mm -hmm. can do with networks mm -hmm. of conscious agents. So it's, it's trivial to prove that our network of conscious agents is computationally universal, but also that it does more, that it, you know, 
it, it can do non-computational things because mm. the Markovian kernels are defined over a probability space and the measurable events in that probability space do not need to be computable. You can have non-computable okay. measurable events. And so yeah, means, yeah, what do you mean by that? Like, how would they be non-computable? Uh, they be, the, because they're exponentially too well, large they're to They're just be... not recursively numerable sets. They're, they're not oh, RE okay, sets. Okay. So as long, as long as they're not RE sets, then there you go. Mm. So there's no no requirement in the definition of, of you know, probability spaces, measure, mm. measure, you know, measurable spaces that the the measurable sets have to be computable. There's no, that's not required in the definition. So that so means <laughs> as soon as you have the possibility of non-RE sets, they could be measurable. And so that means that the Markovian dynamics that we have is, is trivially shown to be um, computationally universal, but it, it, it transcends computation limits because mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it could be defined on non-RE measurable sets. So, so we now have this interesting situation where we have this dynamics of conscious agents and just in the last couple of months, we figured out this projection down to decorated permutations. Then the physicists tell us how to take the decorated permutations, build up um, through something called differential forms, effectively what's called the amplitudehedron. Mm -hmm. And from the mm -hmm. volumes of the amplitudehedron, you get the scattering amplitude. So like if you have large hadron collider and two gluons smash into each other and four gluons go spraying out to be really concrete. Mm -hmm. if you if you try to do that computation in space-time using quantum field theory, mm -hmm. Einstein's Feynman mm -hmm. diagrams, it turns out you need hundreds of pages of algebra, and I think it's it's millions, maybe even billions of terms, but at least millions of mm -hmm. terms mm -hmm. to, to compute it. Just, yeah, just to derive it. Yeah. Just to derive it, because you have yeah, to do yeah. all the, the virtual particles. The, so you, in, mm -hmm. in space-time, to enforce locality and unitarity, you, you, you have to you have all these virtual particles, and so every one of them adds another term to your computation of the scattering, mm -hmm. and you have to mm -hmm. add them all up to satisfy unitarity, right? To, to satisfy quantum theory. So, what the physicists have found, mm -hmm. independent of our work, is if they let go of quantum theory, let go of space-time and quantum theory, and and go to these structures beyond space-time, that particular scattering amplitude that I mentioned, two gluons in, four gluons out, that mm -hmm. was hundreds of pages of algebra, one term, it falls down to one term that you can compute by <clears throat> yeah, hand. Yeah, that's like unreal. Yeah. It's unreal. <laughs> so the math becomes really trivial, and you see new symmetries in the data, something called the infinite Yangian invariant that you can't see okay. in space-time. So, so here's what's happening. When you do it in space-time, the math is unnecessarily ugly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it hides symmetries. When you let go of space-time, yeah. you see deep symmetries that are true of the scattering data, and the math becomes trivial. So that's why physicists are, are realizing space-time, their own theories prove that space-time is doomed. I mean, Einstein's gotcha. gravity and quantum field theory together entail that space-time has no operational meaning mm -hmm. below the Planck scale, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And that's pretty shallow, right? So, I mean, if it was 10 to the minus 33 trillion centimeters, I might be impressed, but 10 to the minus 33, that's a pretty shallow data structure. So, so space-time is not the fundamental reality. It's it's a pretty trivial four-dimensional <coughs> da data structure, or, yeah. or ten or eleven yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in string theory, and it, and it fall it, it poops out at, at ten to the minus thirty-three centimeters. Gotcha. It's just not very deep. So the physicists have realized, okay, space-time isn't fundamental, but that's not stopping them. They found the the amplitudehedron and other structures, and then mm -hmm. decorated mm -hmm. permutations, but they have no notion of dynamics. So what we've given them exactly. is this, this new is all just like frozen geometry and some very abstract space, right? It, it, so. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the situation is sort of like in, in um, um, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Okay. S Stanley Kubrick at, at the end when he's in the room. Well, well there's the monolith, right? <laughs> oh, Remember the, the monolith. The, the yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the monolith and all the apes are looking at it and pounding on it and scared of it. And they're, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. looking at it. They know it's got lots of meaning. But they're clueless about what it, and that's sort of where we are in, in physics. Mm, where we have cool the metaphor, we have this yeah. monolith beyond space time, which is the amplitudehedron and the decorated permutation. Sure, but they're just sure. sitting there, and we've been clueless as because there's no dynamical interpretation of them. Mm -hmm. And what we've shown is that um, if there's a Markovian dynamical interpretation that we think about as Markov dynamics of, of conscious agents. If they don't like consciousness, then they can just use the Markovian dynamics, but they'll have mm -hmm. to think mm -hmm. of what it's about. Markovian dynamics of what? And yeah, we're proposing yeah, yeah. it's more coding dynamics of conscious agents. So we're, we're, we have a paper that's going to be submitted pretty soon called Fusions of Consciousness, which um, goes through all this and also s solves some problems in uh, consciousness theory itself, namely how do you combine conscious subjects mm -hmm. and how do you combine 
um, conscious experiences to create new <clears throat> conscious experiences. And, and it turns out the Markovian dynamics actually gives you beautiful solutions to that. And I'll just mention one briefly, which is sure. we have these, if I have N agents, I could have an N by N matrix of uh, Markovian dynamics uh, describing their, their dynamics. And in certain cases, when the agents interact in certain ways, you can prove that asymptotically, uh, the N by N matrix that describes their interactions will eventually, um, all the rows will have the same values. Okay. So it'll essentially, okay. the, the matrix will drop rank. And when it drops rank, asymptotically, that, that is the mathematical signature of that the agents fused and that they, there's a brand new qualia that's coming out. So we gotcha. described that in this paper. <clears throat> Yeah, so the challenge is how do we get like a single unified conscious experience out of out of our body? And so you're saying this could be some mechanism for creating larger scale, more macro conscious units in, in some way. That's yeah. right, to create more conscious units and also to have those. So that we, we distinguish between mm. combining agents and fusing agents. So when, okay. when you have them how interacting, so? just... Um, they're combined in a system They're, they're combined as a, a single agent. Yeah, but when okay. they drop rank, they fuse. So, so <laughs> I have an N by N... Um, Markovian dynamics of n agents. Yeah. If it if it has full rank, it, it rank of n, then it's a combination because the, the, all the agents are interacting. They do instantiate a single agent, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. but you can still see all the composite agents interacting. I mean, that that kind of sounds like what we want out of out of brain dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. Is we really want to have separable. I don't know, like processors, but then they're still contributing to to, to some a, theater a, of consciousness of the whole. But that's right, a new but, unified whole. Yeah, but yeah, but we still feel like I don't know competing thoughts, different conflicting ideas in our own in our own brains. That, that's so maybe right. It, it kind of addresses some of that. Yeah, that's right. So so that might be the case where the agents were combining, but they hadn't fused. Mm -hmm. But when the mm -hmm. when the dynamics goes to its asymptotic limit, and it literally the n by n matrix drops to rank one, mm -hmm. then you have a brand new, a new agent. It's yeah, literally yeah, yeah. something brand new. And the experience of that agent is a new quality. Mm -hmm. It's a new mm -hmm. experience. And so we're pretty excited. So the paper that we're working on has solution of the combination of subjects, fusion of subjects, combination of experiences, the fusion of experiences. And then mm -hmm. it offers the dynamics that actually we can, we've shown precisely how it gives rise to decorated permutation. So that's not a hand yeah. wave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a mathematically precise way of taking any Markovian dynamics and projecting it canonically onto... Gotcha decorated permutations. So we inherit all the work that the physicists have done to mm -hmm. build space time. <clears throat> so yeah, a lot about what you're talking about. Um, I think when I think about like quantum mechanics and what, what the model kind of suggests, um, to me at least, is mm -hmm. this need to create like, yeah, unified whole entities, you know, maybe some quantum computer of a bunch of entangled quantum bits. And with that, through that coherence, you have the emergence of a single wave function guiding this this larger distributed physical system. And then when you have these quantum systems interacting, there's a measurement and there's the emergence mm -hmm. of some sort of space time through that measurement process or through the interaction. So yeah, to, to what degree um, does this sort of quantum mechanical description like resonate with conscious agents? But then you also said this is like supposed to be more fundamental than than quantum mechanics. So that's right. So yeah. that, so that's what the physicists are saying. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're saying that space time is doomed and quantum theory with it. Mm -hmm. So they're mm -hmm. saying that that quantum theory is not fundamental, mm -hmm. and it will also arise as just an approximate theory to mm -hmm. a much deeper theory. And then the amplitude hedron is is the step that they're taking toward a deeper theory. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that you get so locality and unitarity. Locality is like the structure Einstein structure of space time. And unitarity is the the quantum part of it. Mm -hmm. Both of those mm -hmm. features of space time are coded in the facet structure, or no, the face structure, as you say, mm -hmm. of the amplitude mm -hmm. hedron. So you actually, so it's coded in the geometry of the amplitude hedron. You, you can see where quantum theory and, and space-time emerge as, mm -hmm. as, as projections, right? And it's a many-to-one projection. The amplitude hedron could have billions of dimensions. Mm -hmm. Space-time has 10 or 11, if you mm -hmm. have a string mm -hmm. theoretic representation. Sure. So, so this is very, very different than most people's thinking about things. It's most people think, well, maybe if space-time isn't fundamental, I can use um, entanglement of, of particles somehow to mm -hmm, build up mm -hmm. the structure. And, and this is saying, this is yeah, much, you, this is starting much at the, deeper. You're the wrong location. That's yeah, the wrong yeah, location. Yeah. You, if, if you're using entanglement, you haven't dug deep enough. You mm -hmm, have to actually mm -hmm, go entirely mm -hmm. beyond space-time and quantum theory. And that's what the, so I should mention some names. Nima Arkani Hamed, 
okay. at the Institute for Advanced Study. He's, he's, um, some of the work he's done with Juan Maldacena, uh, yeah. Juan Maldacena on the cosmological polytope and um, Benny Casa, another collaborator on the amplitudehedron and, and so forth. So, and, and there's many, many mm -hmm. others. I mean, I'm not mentioning all, but there's many, many players for in sure, this, but those are some sure. of the players. Cool, exciting. Um, yeah, uh, so what this makes me think about is our, our mathematical understanding. Um, and Roger Penrose, a uh, mm. fan of his work, he has this idea that when we access mathematical truth and we're kind of like thinking about these problems, he he says that there's something about geometry in the way that we're able to think about mathematics. So when you're talking about the amplitudehedron, what I where my mind kind of goes is um, when we're sitting here visualizing and thinking about science or thinking about these different models of consciousness, are we tapping into these different structures? Um, are, and when we visualize, I don't know, some computational process or we're, we're running some math in our head or running some model in our head, how are, are we accessing these these forms, it kind of feels like a bit Platonist, you know, you were accessing these forms, or mm -hmm. would you say that, I don't know, that we're, that we're, we're being derived by these shapes and then, and and then we're interacting in, in some different way. So yeah, bit of an abstract question, but no, yeah. it's, a, it's a great question. It, mm. You know, I've listened to Roger Penrose and I think he's quite cogent on this. He, he points out that Gödel's incompleteness theorem really shows that the person who understands the theorem mm. is understanding something outside of the formal system. Mm -hmm. Something beyond yeah, the formal exactly. system. Yeah, yeah. You're using the formal system, yeah. of course, in a, in a critical way, but you're you're also getting an understanding that um, is outside the system. And, and so he, I think, rightly points out that it's, it's showing that there's this um, intelligence beyond computation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I agree. Mm -hmm. I, so I, I, and I think my my take on Gödel's incompleteness theorem is that it is pointing to uh, an unbounded mm -hmm. intelligence, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and our formal systems can always be beefed up and beefed up and beefed up as much as we want, and they mm -hmm. will never reach that full intelligence because yeah, we're just like trying to approximate closer and closer to that's right. And so that means yeah, that there, as scientists, mm. that means there, there is no such thing as a theory of everything. Mm. Right? So science, if, if we if we talk about a theory of everything, it's only with a wink and a nod because we know <laughs> Gödel's incompleteness theorem says that uh, you know there's always going to if if your if your theory is yeah. sophisticated enough to do arithmetic then it's incomplete. Gotcha, because or, anytime you formalize it in any capacity, huh. you're, you're, you're limited. Oh, that's right. So, yeah. so you, you, either you're... That's a pretty radical notion. Yeah, so there's, <laughs> there's no theory of everything. That's right. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so I agree with Roger on that point of view. Now, I, I, his theory of microtubules and the quantum yeah, yeah, collapse yeah. And, and so forth, those, I think it's not going deep enough. I, I, I mm -hmm, think that... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we have to do what Nima and these other people are doing, which mm -hmm. is to say space-time has been a, a good ride. It's been a really good mm -hmm. framework mm -hmm. for, for centuries. Um, mm -hmm. But we have to literally go entirely outside. We can't just tinker with space-time. We can't mm -hmm. add a little, mm -hmm. little fix here and there. We have to go entirely beyond space-time and then show mm -hmm. how this deeper mm -hmm. structure leads to space-time as, a, frankly, a trivial projection. So, gotcha. so space-time has this grip I mean, yeah, the, the, the richness of our minds and our experiences relative to just like the, yeah, right. the, the, <laughs> the stone cold reality around us. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, exactly right. So, so, so I, I agree with, with Roger mm -hmm. on the idea that it's the girdle's incompleteness theorem is saying that there's this unbounded intelligence. I, I respectfully disagree that we can, even try to bring like non-computational features within space-time to, to solve the problem, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. the notion about gravitational collapse, I mean, of course, he's the expert on gravity, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I, on, on the details of gravity, of course, he's yeah, he's yeah. world-class expert. But but the point that the other physicists are making, like Neymar or Connie Hamed, is that we really have to go, as interesting as that gravitational idea is, we mm -hmm. really have to go entirely beyond space-time mm -hmm. to these, you know, structures that could have trillions of dimensions mm -hmm. and show how space-time re results as, a, as a, a, a trivial projection, frankly, gotcha. of these much yeah, deeper yeah, yeah. structures. And when you go there, they, they we find out, yeah, you can get space-time and quantum theory emerging. All of a sudden, the math becomes easy. Scattering mm -hmm, amplitudes mm -hmm, that take mm -hmm. millions of terms now yeah. take a couple terms, and you see new symmetries. So it, it's not like we're just letting go of space-time for no good reason. It's mm -hmm. because... That's where the symmetries lie. That's where the real essence lies. And that's where the deep insights lie that trivialize and make the mathematics, I wouldn't say simple, but much simpler than inside space-time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, real exciting. Um, well, for practical reasons, we're, we're out of time for today. But um, yeah, it's really great chatting with you. Um, if you have anything else you want to just like mention here at the end. Uh, yeah, so if people want to see this this paper, it's called um, Objects of Consciousness. That's our, our mm -hmm. basic. Yeah, I'll link it. Yeah. And we have a, a paper that um, we're submitting to a, a journal pretty soon called Fusions of Consciousness, where we nice. present this new theory of uh, consciousness beyond space time that projects through the decorated permutations into space time. So our goal in this paper is to show that you can start with consciousness, qua consciousness, not consciousness emerging mm -hmm, from brains, mm -hmm, not consciousness mm -hmm. emerging from integrated information or anything, just consciousness is fundamental and get space time as mm. one of the trivial, trivial user interfaces that some conscious agents might choose to use. Probably mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. one of preference. It's probably just so trivial that many, most conscious agents don't use. We have, we have the cheap model uh, four-dimensional space-time. Uh, many conscious agents probably have much, much more interesting. So cool to think about, like what what that world beyond space-time would look like. You know, yes. just um, yeah, it's it's just rich, dynamic. Like who who knows what that'll that'll end up shaping up to be? Huh? And we'll have to to use mathematics to help our imagination because if I just ask you to imagine a specific color mm -hmm. that you've never seen before, yeah, nothing I happens, feel. right? Yeah, just... So so but 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 and so where our imagination unaided falls flat mm, in his face, mm. even just one color, I can't even think of one. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mathematics allows us to go beyond space time and to go into new to new realms. So that's the power of exciting, mathematics and, and going to this new area. All right, well, hey, we yeah. gotta, we gotta wrap it for Pleasure. today, but um, yeah, it was so great chatting with you. you and, too, uh, I'm really excited to read that paper. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right. All right, well, that was so much fun. Uh, it was really great meeting Don. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about this uh, this model that he's putting out here with these decorated permutations and uh, the amplitude hedron, right? So essentially, the amplitude hedron was this discovery, as he mentions, that there's this very bizarre, multi-dimensional, abstract geometric shape, and once we had thought up this geometric shape we were able to reduce the complexity of a lot of these particle physics derivations. And so the intuition behind this is that this amplitude hedron, this geometric shape, must be more fundamental than these physics equations that we were initially working with. So geometry is more fundamental. There's something fundamental to this geometry. Can we figure out what this geometric description is? And once we can describe that geometry, we can then derive these particle interactions. Um, and so what then he, he proposes is that these Markov chain graphs, these networks of conscious agents can be mapped into what he calls uh, decorated permutations. These decorated permutations can then be mapped into the amplitude hedron and other fundamental geometric forms. And then that can then derive physical interactions and space time and quantum theory. And all of those are subsets of this fundamental geometric form. Okay. And I really tried to understand what decorated permutations are. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at various papers and, and things. Uh, I would love if you out there are a mathematician and you have some insight on this. But my understanding to a first degree is that this is a representation of a Markov chain. So when I look at the simple diagrams that he presents of a decorated permutation where you have a set of numbers and you're mapping it into permutations of other sets of numbers. There seems to be a one-to-one -one mapping between a set of numbers to another. And as you derive that mapping, you can represent it as a graph and as a movement through this graph. So in the graph example in his paper, he says uh, a white circle means make a left turn, 
a black circle means make a right turn. So if you start off at one and you move through the graph, you make a left when you see a white circle, you make a, a right when you see a black circle, you end up at another number and that is the output of your permutation. The way I think about this intuitively is that he's found a sort of mathematics to represent a Markov chain. There's some sort of one-to-one -one mapping where the Markov chain can be represented mathematically in this decorated permutation and then that decorated permutation can become these magical geometric shapes that derive all of physics and then physics is trivialized, quantum mechanics is trivialized as different sub projections from this higher multi-dimensional geometric form. Okay, and this is probably the most Platonist uh, reality version that you could conceptualize where there's the one true geometry, the one true form. Maybe that form is fundamentally beyond our conception. As he says, there's this boundless intelligence. This geometric form at the fundamental basis of reality goes beyond our capacity to ever understand it or maybe even to be understood in principle. Maybe this geometric form defies logic in a computable way where first order logical reasoning falls victim to Gödel's incompleteness theorem that any sort of system of logic that we could grasp is going to be insufficient. So our human, our puny human logic is not sufficient to grasp the beautiful geometric form that is fundamental reality. Okay, but what are some of the problems here? One problem is that this is a sort of static geometry. You know, is there just one geometric shape and that's reality? Is that satisfying to you? Is that the end? We just accept that there is a non-computable, infinite, boundless, beautiful shape at the core of reality and we just accept that and then, and then we're done, we hang up the towel. Um, well, clearly we need to like start figuring out these projections and trying to map this massive geometric truth that's out there and we can start clawing at facets of the the massive geometric form or focus on sub projections of it onto our puny four-dimensional reality um, so that that's maybe one takeaway message from this framing um, I think for me I really do appreciate this this model and I think you know I in my theory, and if you've been watching this, this series, I've been grasping at some way to connect the fractal-like hierarchical regression of nested conscious beings onto the platonic domain. And it feels like Don Hoffman is all about that. He has a nested hierarchy of conscious agents, and he is asserting that those conscious agents our fundamental physics and that pattern or that fractal nesting is fundamental reality and is sufficient to derive all of the platonic world. And so in a way, this is the missing piece of the puzzle in the sort of Justin Riddle <laughs> digital computer, quantum computer, fractal computer model. Um, so I really appreciate that and I'm, I'm all in. I think the my caveat or my concern with maybe the way that he frames the model is he sort of then trivializes space-time, trivializes the concept of time fundamentally, um, saying that we have kind of a crappy four-dimensional headset that we're wearing. I do kind of like that component because the idea is, you know, we're living in this massive multi-dimensional reality and maybe we could one day evolve or you know reach a point where we're able to tap into more of these dimensions you know we move into higher dimensional creatures because we're able to grok more dimensions of reality um, and we get a more advanced headset as Don Hoffman would say um, however I feel like the concern here and we touched on this in the previous episode about simulation theory is you end up with this sort of like 
solipsistic nihilism of, well, you know, we just got to submit to the one true geometry of the universe and there's no point of being alive. And my conscious experience is just part of the, the nested hierarchy. So maybe that gives you meaning, but it, 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 it just, it's just kind of strange, you know, it's like, isn't there some boundary to, to us? Isn't there some thing to quantum computers, to digital computers, to our place in the universe right now? And I think one thing I appreciate about the Hammeroff Penrose model is that we are at a certain stage of evolution on this planet where we are building better and better organisms through evolution. Our consciousness, the quantum computer of our brain is expanding. Our technology could further expand the quantum computational capacities of our brains. And there's sort of a purpose of building tech and expanding the human mind and you are on the planet orbiting the sun uh, in, in this moment of time. You know, it's not quite so, I don't know, deep into simulation theory that time isn't real and space isn't real. You know, I feel like there's something slightly disingenuous there where I do think that there's something paradoxical going on. And Carl Jung talks about this where at the core of reality, there, there's some paradox where, yeah, we're in this infinite fractal of all conscious beings, but also space and time is very much real. You know, there is this moment in time, there is this moment in space. And Roger Penrose cautions when he describes the three world model that the physical world is still very important. You know, it's one of the three aspects of reality. Your conscious experience, the physical world, and then also this domain of mathematics and fractals and meaning. And so there's more to just diving into the platonic world, you know? And I kind of see the, the more recent Hoffman framing in 2023 as all about let's map these decorated permutations. All we need to do is dive into higher dimensional space and start mapping out amplitudehedrons and other, you know, wild geometric forms. And, and, and that is the core of reality versus the Penrose model acknowledges the human experience and the physical domain as having this really nuanced, complicated interplay. And I think there's still more mystery at the level of the mental world and at the level of the physical world. But I think Don successfully really taps in to the mystery of the platonic domain with these nested hierarchies of conscious agents tapping into fundamental laws of physics. And that really captures my imagination. And like I said earlier, really is sort of the missing piece of the puzzle of, of what I've been thinking about in uh, this three world model of digital computers and fractal computers. So let me know what you think out there. If you understand decorated permutations, I'd love to hear what you have to say. And I'll talk to you again very soon.